So thanks for showing up, everyone. Um, so this is, as the first slide says, this is an introduction to operations. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about uh, what operations are and how they're going to work in full scale on the layout. Uh, talking about car <laughs> handling, switching, the different roles you'll play, the different trains they'll be running on the layout. How sessions are going to be run, a uh, little bit of time for questions and answers at the end if you have any. And then at the end, uh, we're going to head upstairs and we've got some basic switching games set up uh, so we can get some practice in moving cars around. Uh, how many people have done uh, an operation session on this layout or another layout with car cards or moving cars around? <laughs> yeah, car, hands went down. All right. And how many people have actually worked on a railroad? <laughs> All right. All right, so what is operations? In short, it is doing railroad work, doing stuff that makes the railroad money. You're pick railroads are logistics companies. You're picking up cars from one customer and moving them across the line to other customers. And then more than that, you're connecting the model railroad to a larger world. Because despite how large our model railroad is, we're only modeling a small part of it, um, and then we're not even thinking about modeling all the other railroads that tie into it. So operations is sort of simulating those connections over the rest of the network. What isn't operations? It's not reading this rule book and knowing it verbatim. Um, it's not the only right way to model a railroad. If you enjoy rail vanning, just setting your trains up on the line and watching them run by, that's just fine. Uh, it's not just moving cars around. Um, you can run mainline trains with operations. Um, and in fact, switching is one of the things that the railroad likes doing least because it makes the least amount of money. They want to move as many cars on as few trains as possible. Um, but it is obviously important for the end of the line uh, movement of the cars, but it's just one part of it. Um, and then it's not following every railroad rule and procedure to 100% accuracy because at that point, you're not playing with trains anymore. You're doing a job. Especially on a club layout, flexibility is key. We want to make sure to have a proper balance between realism and actually having fun. Uh, and we can adjust that as we need uh, until we get a nice balance. Just, and just even change it per session, depending on who shows up. All right, so we've got our layout here. It's cool. We already know it works good for open houses, just watching trains run by. But how do we make it into an operational railroad? All right, so let, we'll start with two yards. That's a good start. Uh, every train needs to be built somewhere. Um, so these are obviously good starting points. All right, and then we'll run a line in between the two yards. Uh, like I said, open house, this is what we do all the time. Uh, but it doesn't really accomplish anything for the railroad. You're just shuttling cars in between two yards and not really getting anywhere. So how do we prove that? Well, we have stations. Uh, we can stop at various stops along the railroad. And we can drop off goods. And in some cases, there's closed loops of production. So you can see at Croker, um, they'll, they're sending out grain, and we actually have businesses in Columbia Furnace that will take grain. So you have a closed loop moving grain from one spot in the layout to another. Uh, here, another example we have a gas distributor up in Winchester, and they can send gas down to one of the several gas distributors. There's one in Kieseltown, which we can't get to, I'll get to that. Um, but there's another one in uh, Columbia Furnace as well. Uh, but there's a problem. <laughs> we have some businesses that don't have anywhere in the layout we can send them to. Um, we, Columbia Furnace has an Armour meat packing plant. We don't have any stockyards. Uh, Kieseltown's got a scrap yard that's sending scrap out. We're, we don't have anywhere to send scrap. We don't have a steel mill or anything. And, and there's an auto yard in Winchester. We don't have an auto plant. Uh, and a lot of those things, especially auto plant, take up a lot of room. We don't have room to build that kind of stuff. So how do we solve that? Well, there's a couple different solutions. <laughs> so the first option is interchanges. Yeah. Interchanges represent points where you switch cars with another railroad to get stuff off the network uh, or to different points of the network. So in our case, we have a couple different interchanges that happen to both be on the lower deck. Uh, the first is the car float down there in West Point. So that will get you up. Uh, it's currently modeled as the Southern Railroad. Uh, and then we have the RFP interchange just a little bit up the line in uh, Thornburg. So it happens to be right next to each other, which isn't ideal, but it works for now. 
Um, but that they can each only handle so many cars. The float can hand, hold about 12, depending on how long the cars are, and the RFB interchange is currently said to only hold like six. So that's only not even on the whole train. So what do we do for stuff that isn't going uh, to those two locations? Staging! <laughs> so staging represents all the points on the layout that we can't model just because we don't have infinite amount of room. Um, so you can see here, in our case, uh, if you've read the backstory of the um, CBW Railroad, uh, Frank Creek <coughs> is actually not even the midpoint. It's like a third of the way down. Uh, it terminates in St. Louis, so there's a two-thirds of the railroad that we don't even model. So staging represents a lot of that, and because we're hiding a lot of that, we're also hiding a bunch of interchange points, a bunch of yards, and so that's a whole bunch of customers that we can ship cars into. Uh, and also you can see on this one, on the other end, uh, for the elevator, I've also put in a, a port. So that's a, because being a terminal yard, Langley can be a little bit limiting what it pulls in. So the port just acts as another sink at the other end so you can model stuff that gets exported overseas. Uh, but in both cases, they have, since we have the elevator, they both get hidden in that staging yard. And that allows us to, again, model connections between railroads that we don't necessarily have on the layout. And it really expands the options for what we can do operationally. Uh, and then once we do that, once that's set up, it's up it's really inefficient to just have one train do work everything. It would take days and clock be three miles long. They do it nowadays, but um, the more efficient way to do it from a time standpoint is to break it up at different trains. So in our case, we have two different subdivisions, one working out of Langley, one working out of French Creek. They meet at Columbia Furnace, and we have multiple different local trains that stop at different industries along the route and strip the cars and pull them back in, and then those cars move to the yard, and manifest trains move them in between the yards. So that's basically how the car movement works on the layout. All right, so what about uh, divisions? All right, so like I mentioned, at the far end, basically what's inside the elevator, uh, we have something I'm calling point comfort. So this is not technically a separate division, uh, but it's an extension of laying the yard. Um, it represents a seaport that has multiple different industries that we simply don't have room to model, but gives us options to service multiple different types of trains that we'd like to run. For example, a shipping terminal. So if you've got your model trains, that's where they're headed. Uh, they can also take more standard cars, like uh, boxcars with merchandise, grain, hoppers, produce reapers, all kinds of stuff, depending on what era we're modeling. Because, but yeah, depending on what era we're modeling, if you're going before like the 50s, they didn't containerize freight, so you'd have more normal boxcars. But more modern era, of course, they'd have something like this, lots of intermodal containers. But that just gives us an option to send those big, long intermodal trains to. Uh, auto terminal, same thing. Um, if you've got a big auto rack train, you can send it from Winchester down into the uh, the elevator. Power plant. Uh, we need somewhere to send all those big long coal trains to. So that's where those go. Plan B. Yep. Or a control port. Yep, exactly. Just like the either of the coal terminals we have here. Uh, and then just if we need, if we have too many cars to send to the layout, which we don't at this point, we actually have. Uh, just enough industry to service all the cars we have. Um, but if we need to send them off somewhere, we can use the, the port for that as well. All right, now for the stuff that's actually on the layout. Uh, Langley subdivision. That's from Phoebus to Columbia Furnace. Um, the nature of this is it's mostly small customers. There's not a ton of industries that take more than one or two cars, but there's a lot of them. You can see 28. So uh, you need a lot of different smaller local trains to spread that traffic out and make sure you're not totally clogging the line. Um, there's chairs over here, that's it. Um, there's two interchanges, like I mentioned, car float and r &P. And then French Creek is from Shenandoah up to French Creek. Uh, it's got fewer small industries, but it's got a lot more empty control points. There are a few small industries, but they tend to be crammed around the towns. Um, but the main this uh, difference is that there's a lot of larger industries. We've got the ethanol plant, once that gets back up and running, or if it ever gets up and running, but that's, a, that's another question. Uh, we've got the uh, we've got the paper mill, uh, among other things, uh, and the uh, auto yard. 
Uh, and so we do have a couple locals running around upstairs, but we also have dedicated switchers that stay at those locations. The locals drop off the cars and the switchers actually stay at those stations and work the cars there. So there's a little bit of a difference in how those two uh, operate, which can add, add some nice variety. Cool. And then like I mentioned, uh, staging yard, uh, it's calling it Louisville. That's going to be, that's the next major city on the main line. Um, and this is where we send a lot of the traffic that we don't have spots for on the layout and where we get a lot of those commodities like oil, plastics, chemicals, <laughs> produce. Uh, and we can also get more coal and grain and automobiles through there if we need them for more trains. Um, and most cars that don't go to either the port or somewhere on the layout will head into staging. So how do we actually work this? Uh, we are using JMRI operations. What is that? It is a native plugin to JMRI. You don't need to install anything else. It comes in there. It's a little bit hidden under a menu. Uh, but what it requires a lot of setup, which I've already done. The way JMRI works is I set up those schedules, and then once you set it up, it will automatically, every session, look at where all the cars have been, and then point them to somewhere they else need to go. And it's semi-random. So the thing with car cards, if you're familiar with that, those work pretty well, but every car has only like three or four different places it can go to. So it can get a little bit repetitive. Here, it's actually more like a prototypical car routing system where it just picks a car that's available and ships it somewhere. Um, so you can have any appropriate car go to any location. So every session is going to be a little bit different. We're not going to be sending the reefers to a coal mine, are we? Nope. Okay. nope. I've already no, said the MRI tags those cars yep. and knows what type they are, so yep. the industry and the cars match. Yes. Yep. So you will only, it's been around a while. Yep. So you'll <laughs> only be sending coal hoppers to coal mines, you'll only be sending grain hoppers to elevators, all that stuff is already set up. It took me days. So the, the, that doesn't mean rear railroads don't do that. Cutter, yeah. the <laughs> the yeah. right. street, is that the printout, the JMRI? No, that is, is that um, the output no, that is the, uh, oops. that is what's called the build report. Um, that's in the back, on the back end for me to see how the, it's going to the other trains. I'll okay. show in a couple slides what the well, actual switch looks like. Okay. All right, so like I said, that's all back end stuff. So, but how do you, on the railroad, know where your cars need to go. And we're going to use a couple methods. First, like I mentioned, that is what your switch list looks like. So JMRI, once it builds a train, it will print you a switch list and tell you where all the trains need to go. Uh, but the thing about that is if you're not familiar with car IDs and track locations, all that, this can be a little bit overwhelming. So we have a backup method, which I'll get into. I'm just calling it dots. But we'll get into that. So this, if you see, this is CPWR operations. This is an actual switch list that I printed out from JMRI. So you can see it generates a manifest for every train built. Uh, it outlines every car by, uh, so you can see orange reefer, PFE, 454522, load empty. And if you see if it's got load, it'll tell you what the load is. And then it tells you what track it's gonna go to. And in this case, it's color coded. Green cars are where you're picking up cars. Red is where you're dropping them off. Um, so it's really pretty straightforward if you know what you're looking for. They'll even tell you stuff like, uh, so at the end of a run, they'll tell you, see, you're departing Langley, eastbound, four cars, 216 feet, 293 tons. It gets that specific. Uh, you can even set it up, see, arrival times, departure times. If you have a passenger train, I can set up a timetable. You can get really, really detailed. Another question. Yeah. Does it have the option for colors other than red, red yes. and green? Are you colorblind? Well, I wouldn't do yeah, the colors because the printers I have, they're all monochrome. Okay. okay. I'm just on Christmas Eve. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, too much um, red and green. So yeah. Colored blindness. Well, as soon as he said red and green, I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, that's just my block. I can make him yellow and blue. I can make him gray yeah. and black. Yeah. Yeah. Make him black and white. Red and green is black. the worst. So you only know that you're dropping off cars. Picking up, that's anyone's job. Is there a way to. Be able to change it so it's not the colors are telling you to drop off. Is there a way that it can be typed in the report to drop off? Rob, it can be formatted into a drop off. So, and a, okay, yeah, so, pick up yeah, list. I, I so will make for the color blind. Yeah, spot. Yeah. Up for color blind. yeah, and you actually see it says spot, pull, spot, pull, spot, pull. Okay, so yeah, mm -hmm. that's, Sorry, that's already built in. Yeah, into the reading. Yeah, it's even got, uh, and all this is also on the computer. It's also, I didn't get into this in the presentation, but this also shows up on your phone. We can set up Gemrai to um, and your tablet. 
And you have one. <laughs> so uh, you hook up to the Wi-Fi. So you hook up to the Wi-Fi router, uh, and you open up uh, a local web page, and yep. it gives you a checklist at every stop. Um, awesome. We're not getting into that, that to tablet. begin with, but <laughs> once you are like more comfortable, that's some really cool stuff we can play with there. Mm. Um, the basics first. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of basics, like I said, as much as this is laid out, this is a lot if you've never done operation before. Yeah, that's actually so to begin with, at least, we have a backup method. I call that dots. So every single car is going to get a colored dot. It's got a letter and a number. Uh, the letter is just so, like you mentioned, if you're colorblind, you can still tell what train it's supposed to go to. And the number tells you what track it's going to. And there's a, going to be a matching dot on every single track on the layout. So all you have, you, everyone's going to get a manifest so you can learn how to read them. But as a training wheels, basically, it's a big dot in real life. You, all you have to do, <laughs> match the dot with the dot on the layout. I am hoping everyone can do that. <laughs> not, I don't know, I know what we're going to do. <laughs> Put them into management. <laughs> I might have to refer you to additional training, Put but hopefully this is going to be uh, a good way for you to be able to move cars around without having to put too much mental effort uh, to begin with. And then as you learn the manifest, we can kind of lean off that. But it's, if we ever get new members, we can also put that back up. We're putting these people in charge of uh, for unit, tra unit trains are working different. So okay. unit trains here, do you're moving them all as a unit. So I'm not going to tackle this. Okay. It's going to be only for cars for manifest trains and stuff like that, where you're dropping off cars individually. Uh, and in fact, it's already happened in Jamboree where coal cars in particular get moved as a unit. They never get broken up. Okay. Yeah. And like I mentioned, um, the dots and the manifest are going to have the exact same information. So if you can have the manifest with you, and you can use the dots, but then as you're, use, as you're switching, you can sort of learn where all the tracks are, what the different codes on the cars and the manifest actually mean, and you can use them in tandem to learn how the switch lists work. All right, so what roles can you play? All right. Break this up into two sort of separate groups. We've got admin, those are the people working in the background to make sure everything's working good and no one crashes. <laughs> so your road crews, engineers, conductors, and then your yard master is sort of in between. They're sort of in both a car moving and a manager managerial role. He sits more in the manager position. Yeah. You don't know what's going on at all. Yeah, but you are moving <laughs> cars around. So, you know, technically you're both. All right, so yeah, roles. Train master. Um, usually that's going to be whoever's running the operating session. Uh, start with B. Um, they're the people assigning cars to trains, building trains, and deciding what trains are going to run for the day. Like I said, Jim Ryan handles a lot. Of that. Um, they work with the dispatcher to make sure the schedule is balanced, make sure we're going to have too many meets or trains are going to be clogged up at chunk points. Um, and also, um, in our case, there's going to be priorities of trains. So passenger trains over uh, express trains, over normal manifest trains, over local trains. And so it's going to be the uh, Train master's job to explain that to the dispatcher so the trains move uh, how they're supposed to. Provide snacks. And provide snacks. Hey, train master, you get I next time. Train master, <laughs> I met uh, didn't mention that. That's why I'm a good train. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he, right he told me no uncertain terms. He got more information out of the Fred than the crew back in the caboose. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I said, okay, I don't want to be in that conversation. <laughs> Dispatcher, you mostly know what this guy does already. Uh, he's in charge of making sure all the trains move and hopefully don't hit each other. Sometimes. Kendall? <laughs> we won't go any further into that. <laughs> <laughs> the Kendall effect. <laughs> and, um, in, the, in the specific context of operations, they're also going to be moving all the turnouts that are directly on the main line. So engine crews doing switching are going to have to do a lot of uh, communication with them to communicate, hey, I need this siding opened, I'm blocking this crossover for a bit, um, so we can get those switches moving and keep trains moving and figure out where trains need to stop or run around. Is there like a common that. language requirement? No. English. Uh, I'm English? Not <laughs> Half the time you can't understand dispatch. Uh, like I said, uh, work with the train master to figure out train priorities and keep track of moving. Say, Chan, this is an option roll and one, one that we might not use to begin with. Um, they're basically, they're just, if we need trains set up in staging during the session, 
um, they'll be up in that little platform setting up trains uh, and deconstructing them as they move on and off. Thin people. Thin hmm? people. Uh, I can fit up there. So you don't have to be that thin. Um, but it's not going to be needed every time because if we have few enough trains and enough tracks on in staging, we just pre-build them. Um, but if we're really busy sessions, then I can need Engineer! You get to drive the train! Uh, you, you're talking with dispatch, you're moving the throttle up and down and hitting the brakes yeah. to make sure you're moving, you're not jostling the loads too much. Um, during operating sessions, if you're using two two member crew, which we'll talk about, you're staying up by the locomotive, and you get to blow the horn, so it's objectively the best job on the layout. Far down. Far and you down. stay in the warmth of the air condition. Air, if it's working. Warmth of yeah. the air condition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Conductor, uh, they're the boss of the train. They are uh, checking the manifest, making sure you're on time and all the cars getting dropped off and picked up accurately. Uh, they're telling the engineer what to do during switch your moves, so they're saying how many cars you've got behind you, uh, how fast you need to go, things like that. They're doing the uncoupling, and they're throwing all the manual switches that dispatch is not in charge of. Uh, and during running, they're going to stay near the caboose, uh, but during switching, they can pretty much move wherever the cars are going. Um, so a lot of times, uh, engineer and conductor are the same person, but if you want to add realism and add a little bit more complexity, you can always break it up into two people, have an engineer conductor, uh, and this is also actually a very good method for training new people into operations. So you have your experienced person as a conductor uh, directing the engineer, who's the trainee, how to move the cars around. So a really nice sort of built-in uh, method for teaching new newbies there. And then yard master. You're, as soon as the yard, the train enters the yard, it's not the dispatcher's job anymore, it's yours. Um, you want, <laughs> so you, yeah, so. Couldn't help Kendall. Sorry, Charles. Just stop! Uh, so, not yet, but they're pretty obvious. No, no, no. Um, so, and, uh, and Langley Yard is going to be from one of the yard lead to the entrance of the ladder of the other end. And French Creek is just the either end of the ladders. Uh, and then also the lead extensions. Yard limits. Yeah. It's pretty obvious, but. There's no reason we can't put in some more obvious yard limits on just to be a little bit more prototypical. Uh, but, and let Kendall know where everything is. Yep. Uh, your most important job as a yard master is classifying trains. So when trains pull into the yard, you are breaking them up, you're adding sections as they move on, and then once you pull the cars off, you are arranging them into the trains they need to go to to get to their destination. Uh, and then if you're if you're using a club engine, if you're allowing the yard master to use your engine, they'll also be hostling engines in and out of the service facilities. Be a little bit more practical. If you don't want anyone driving your engines, that is fine. You can move your engine yourself, but it, the part difficult way to do it is that you don't touch the engine until it's ready to go, if you're the engineer. So, unless you're on a small railroad where everyone does anything. <laughs> where you wear every hat. Yes. Uh, as far as classification goes, uh, you as the yard master get to decide how the yard is set up. Usually you just need one arrival track, one departure track, sometimes they're the same track, uh, but it's a arrival departure track makes it a little easier. And then any number of classification tracks depending on how many trains you have going out for the day. Uh, and you can actually use one track for multiple trains because a lot of locals, they're going to be no more than like five or six cars, so you can fit multiple trains on the one track if you can uh, divide it up. But that's going to be your job as the yard master to figure that out. There's actually, I put whiteboards um, in the dispatch office, and you can just mark for the day the local train number one is going to this track, the manifest train is going to this track, et cetera, et cetera. All right, time for go over basic switching moves. All right, so first, yard switching. Here's our uh, inbound train. It just pulled into the arrival track. So hopefully it's not this scrambled. Um, because usually the classification yard before is going to be doing a lot of the organizing. <laughs> but as you can see by the giggling, sometimes they do a terrible job. Uh, more than sometimes. So a lot of times they'll be getting just a mess. Um, so once it arrives, um, you're going to be, if it's moving on, uh, you'll uh, cut off the cars that are dropped off at this stop, and you'll pin on the cars that are moving on, and it'll move on. But once that train's handled, you grab this cut of cars, whoop, and you start classifying it by destination first. So you can see, at, 
one track per destination. Again, uh, if you've got room, you can put multiple in one track, but just for simplicity. Uh, and then once that's all sorted, when a train is just about to leave, you reclassify it by track. <laughs> Again, if you have time and if you're good. Um, that's, this just makes it easier for the road crew so they don't have to be shuffling through cars on the main line. All right, and then once the train's ready to go, you move it back to the departure track, you pin on the caboose and the engine, and it moves on. All right, and then that gets us to road switching. So this is a diagram of basically all the basic elements that you'll encounter switching on the main line. So this is a trailing point <laughs> spur. A trailing point spur is any turnout that opens up behind your engine or behind your caboose. They are the easiest tracks to service because all you have to do is back in. Facing point is any point that diverges ahead of your train, uh, depending on what direction the train is moving. And a runaround is any pair of switches that let you move your engine from one end of the train to the other. This can be a pair of crossovers, this can be a siding, this can be a crossover and a siding, uh, any arrangement of switch that you can fit an entire train in uh, and get from one end to the other to shove from the other end or turn your train around. And then sometimes we have what's called a switchback. Switchback is when you have a pair of uh, switches branching off each other but one's in the opposite direction. This saves room in some cases, but it's a lot harder to switch because you can see you have to pull in, back up, and then go back forward into your spur. But if there's cars in the lead, you have to pull those out first and then get them back in when you're done. So these can be a real pain in the butt, depending on how they're set up. Um, and another thing you have to keep in mind is that you have to organize your push based on the orientation of the switchback, not the main lead. So in this case, you would have to do a runaround before you shove your car in in order to get back there. All right, let's start with this a basic uh, trailing point switching loop. All right, so you can see we have our stations one, two, and three. These two need to be pulled, and you, we have two cars to be dropped off. Six is going to be moving on to the next stop. All right, so decouple that car, pull it out, throw the switch back into the spur, grab the car, Pull it out, throw the switch again, back it in, make sure you're clear of the switch. Pull out again, back in, decouple, pull back out, throw the switch to close, grab your train, and you're moving on. Simple as that. All right, now for a facing point. There's two different ways you can handle this. Um, there's actually more than that, but on a model railroad, these are the two that are most um, feasible. So. Uh, the easiest way is if you are a turn, so a turn is a local train that uh, on its run heads out to one location and then turns around and heads back to where it started. If you're doing a turn, the easiest way to handle a facing point is to wait until you're heading back and then it becomes a, a trailing point and you can just switch it like I just showed. Uh, and you can use crossovers, etc., to get you on the right main line to switch it. Um, however, there's some cases, especially if it's on the end of the line where that's not an option, and you will have to do uh, a runaround. So here's how a runaround works. Train pulls in. You have to make sure that all the train fits in between your two runaround switches. If not, you'll have to leave a portion of your train out past the runaround uh, and make sure you have enough room to actually pull your engine in. Yeah. So once that happens, you decouple. Uh, and a lot of this um, is going to be on the main line, so you'll have to communicate all of your moves to the dispatcher. Same goes for the last slide, because you were technically blocking a crossover. Um, so all that's going to have to be coordinated with the dispatcher. Okay, there's gonna make sure there's such a brace on the cut of cars that you leave behind. Yeah. If you're on a hill, make sure you got a thumbtack or something. Yeah. All right, so you pull ahead of the first end of the runaround. It gets routed. Both ends get routed around the train. You go around. Switch gets closed. You couple to the end. Um, in some cases, uh, this is not a case for more modern trains, especially those without cabooses, um, but before the advent of the steel caboose, uh, a lot of times the railroad would not let you shove with the caboose, uh, either because you're jostling the crew around, uh, especially if it's, if it's overnight night train, the crew's trying to sleep, uh, but also a lot of them are wood framed and they just couldn't handle the stress of being shoved and they would splinter. 
So and we're not going to worry about that for most of our sessions, but um, in some cases, you'll have to put the caboose somewhere before you do this move. But anyway, you attach to the back of the train. You cut your car, make sure that whatever cards you leave off are clear of the switch you're doing. And then at this point, it's just like the trailing point move that we just mm -hmm. demonstrated. So back in, grab the car, attach to your train, pull out, shove your car in, reattach. Then you just pull your train back into the runaround, run back around, and then you're on your way. Simple as that. Now the last move is reversing it. Like I mentioned, if you're a turn, you're going to have to turn around at the end of your route. Um, luckily, if you're a diesel engine, you don't have to worry about uh, doing, going through a Y or a turntable anymore, so you can just back your engine up. But you still have to move the caboose to the other end of the train. Uh, luckily, this is pretty easy. Uh, this is basically a combination of a runaround, a set out, and a pickoff all in one move. So what you do, once you reach the end of the line, there's always going to be a siding available for you to use. So just do your normal runaround. You pick up the caboose, cut it off. Send it off on the opposite track. Again, communicate with the dispatcher because at this point you are blocking the entire main line, so he's going to have to know that. So you have your caboose there, grab the rest of the train, pull it free, and shove it into the runaround, and then your train is fully turned around and ready to depart. All right, that's all the basic moves for switching a train. So, what trains do we run? I have a quick question. Are yes. Normal. Uh... On double track, we normally right hand. Runner. Normally, but that is just typical. And back during the session, we're going to be trying to break that um, that sort of mentality a little bit because actually you're going to be going left hand running for most of the session because it's going to be basically whatever the dispatch is most convenient for the dispatcher. So if you're a local train and most of your stuff is on the left hand main, he's going to put you on the left hand main and he's just going to run trains around you. So yes, typically. Right-hand running is the norm on this railroad, but you can put, the dispatcher can put you on whatever main he wants. And as long as you're following his directions, it should be fine. As long as he knows what he's doing. Here's the different trains. Local trains, like I mentioned, these are the ones that are actually going out, dropping off cars at their various industries, and picking them up and pulling them back to the yard. Um, <laughs> manifest trains, their job is once all the cars get to a yard, they're moving it in between the yards. So if you've got a car in, in, uh, in Croker that needs to get to, to somewhere up above, it gets sent to Langley first and then moves on a manifest train up to French Creek. These are usually somewhat longer trains. Unit trains, these are cars, trains that move all of one commodity, our coal trains, our intermodals, our grain trains, things like that. And then passenger trains, you know what they do. They pick up people and move them around. All right, just a quick introduction before we get into that. Uh, every train on the railroad has a symbol that identifies what it is. You don't have to know what these mean um, to do your job, but I'm just going to go through them real quick just to give you an idea. I know the French, 31. Uh, good job. Uh, just to give you an idea. So at a glance, when, I, when we put the schedule up on the board, you can tell at a glance what each train is doing for the day. All right, so like you already figured out, uh, if it's a moving one yard to another, uh, it's a two-letter code, starting with where it's starting and ending where it's ending. So we have Langley, French Creek. Louisville starts with a K because it already starts with L, but Kentucky starts with a K. So that's where trains that are moving to staging will start with K. Uh, and then passenger and unit trains, they have their own codes because uh, sometimes they don't stop on ER. So it's more convenient for them to be marked with um, their unit code. So like C for coal, G for grain, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're a local train, you're just going to have that first code so that you can tell if it's just got one letter and it's not a unit train, uh, it's going to be a local. And then if it's a manifest train, it's going to have two codes. So the terminal is here. And then the last digit indicates which direction it's moving. So 1, 3, 5, and 7, moving east. 2, 4, 6, and 8, moving west. If it's 0, it's a turn. If it's 9, it's a switcher. Not, switcher means it never leaves the station where it's stationed. Alright, so we have oh, several. It's like a switcher over in Columbia Furnace, so it'll be a nine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the main switchers we have are actually for like French Creek. So West Waco has a switcher. Um, I think I touched one of the only ones right now. Um, um, but yeah, 
Um, so here's some of the different trains we have. We have a turn going from the yard to Norge, Croker, and Arsenal signing. It's not working right now, but when it does, it'll be served by that. We have a turn just for Phoebus. We have a switcher for the Naval Weapons Station. Uh, technically, it does go to the yard, but because it's such a short range of the yard, I'm still classifying it as a switcher. Uh, we have the Columbia turn, it hits Thornburg, Rapid, and Columbia Furnace. Uh, and then we have a special train for coal cars moving uh, between the upper deck and the coal tier, once that signing's working. French Creek, uh, like I said, fewer turns. Uh, we got what's called the Mingo turn that works wide in Winchester. Uh, telegraph turn that is just works that sort of branch line between Winchester and uh, the ethanol plant once that's running. Uh, Shenandoah turn uh, for Hagee, Kieseltown, and Shenandoah. Again, Kieseltown's not working right now, so it's basically just going to be Hagee and Shenandoah when that switches back online. And then uh, Carbon Extra, which is the the counterpart for the one downstairs, that's moving cars in between French Creek and the coal mines of the carbon. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, switchers, long more upstairs, we've got one uh, that services all the different facilities uh, around the yard, got one for Wessico, and one for the other yard. Manifest trains, um, like I mentioned, code tells you where they go, and you just add more numbers depending on how many. Usually, we are only going to need one a day, but if Let's say you're bringing your own train and you want to run next freight, we'll classify it as a manifest and we'll add a number to it. Unit trains, uh, different code for different trains. Auto racks, C A, C for coal, uh, C E for coal empties. Uh, we have two different types. All of our two bays uh, go between carbon and the coal pier, and our 100 tons are going to be going between Hagee and Staging. Uh, military trains. D series, G for grain, R for reefers, uh, T for tank cars, W for intermodal, because well car, that's what, and then B for any bulk that doesn't have to fit any of those, like this. This, this huh. train full of harvester will be a B train. Now, is any of this that's similar right to what they use on the river road? Or no? It's based vaguely on a combination of North like and Southern NS and CSX. uses numbers like coal trains are normally 800 series. Intermodal is normally 200 series. So they use a number series. Yeah, yeah I think so CSX letters. uses letters. CSX uses letters. CSX uses letters. letters. DNSF. Letters. Yeah, it's a, yes. Yeah. Well, it's sort of a it's letter, a set it's a number, thing. and then the date it originated. Yeah. Yeah. All matters, we don't bother with because that's it's way too far in the weeds. Yeah. It was like, all that matters the way is we're doing it. What you're showing us is what we're going to use, right? Okay, so are we going to get this posted somewhere so folks can look at it, yes. see it, and yes, this, uh, all this stuff? Because the British says This is good. So the, I'm, I'm so talking right now, it's going up on YouTube, the, and the, uh, this presentation <laughs> will be uploaded to the <laughs> Facebook. No, you're not. There's a website if I can get it there. Recommend okay, you'll too, post if you can post it, like we got stuff posted on the wall behind you. That yes. That great. Somewhere. Yeah. That or dispatch or somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've got something, something typed up already. Um, moving on. Uh, passenger trains is either CBMW specific or Amtrak. Um, just we have one refill train that goes from one to the other, uh, and then a little shell service that runs in between Croker and the naval naval base that we can use like an RDC or something. And then additional heritage excursions as needed. Yes. So yep. So if you want to run your uh, Y6B with a whole bunch of circle cars, be my guest. Just make sure you have room on the schedule. All right, so that's all of the nitty gritty. So how's this actually going to work? All right, so before the session starts, uh, I'm going to be here like the day before, uh, getting everything set up. Uh, all trains should be clear from the yards if possible. If there's a couple left over, it's not that big of a deal. The rail crews really only need like maybe five or six yards, but the clearer they are, the better, especially the staging yards. So I'll be sitting on them. Uh, a message every time that there's going to be a session. They're going to be regularly scheduled. So you'll know when they're coming up, and we get, we'll try to get the yards as clear as we can. Uh, whoever's organizing the session, um, starting off usually me, uh, checks the car inventory, uh, see if there's any cars missing or broken, and updates it. And then I push button, and GM Ride tells me where all the cars need to go. And I move them there, and then I print all the switch lists. Um, start with, all the switch lists are going to be pre printed. But eventually, what we can also do is actually build trains as they're needed. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, uh, you'll have both an app on your 
phone if you have that, or they will actually show up on this TV screen. And so we'll have an actual running schedule as trains pop up. It's pretty neat. But first, to start, we're just going to be printing out all the switches at once. All right, uh, if we have any tra trains that need to be staged, we'll build the stage. Uh, if we're using dots, those will be set up. And then I will put the schedule on the whiteboard um, so everyone knows what trains are running for the day and what they can choose from. All right, so what should you bring to a session? It's basically like uh, an open house session, more or less. You need your radio. You need a throttle, either the Drex or something that can run on Y throttle. Uh, you need a look. What if you if you run on it instead of one of the club engines? We do have lots of club engines, but you know you've got these expensive trains. You want to run them, I understand. So and it's a club, so we're not going to worry about you not running the prototypical stuff. But you just keep in mind, bring something that's appropriate for the jobs you want to run. Uh, if you want to bring run the local and bring your big boy, you can try. <laughs> we'll all laugh at you. Yes. And when you get caught up on a number four switch, dispatch will just laugh at you while we route trains around your butt. And you'll distract the rest of us waiting for you to fix yourself. Yeah, so yeah. be a good be the like good guy. Yeah. And <laughs> don't bring, like if you're running a manifest train, yeah, bring your big boy. That's, that'd be great. But if if you're gonna do switching, bring something appropriate. Luckily most diesels are good fine for that as long as you're not doing something like a centipede. But oh. most most Eight even six X switches can handle most of the travel. So that's really not an issue. Um, and then if you want to bring your own train, that is absolutely fine. Um, the difference between that and our normal um, open houses is that you do need to let the, um, uh, the session runner know beforehand because you need to be put into the schedule. Uh, this could be as little as like an hour beforehand, but you, you do need to be slotted in. You're not just being able to put your train on the, on the yard and go whenever you want. You have to be scheduled. Cutter. A question with that. Um, as far as train classification in that case, would it be done as... You would be given as... wh whatever code is appropriate for your train. Okay. I didn't so, know if it would just be, all right, you're an extra because it's your own stuff. Or not. Yeah, it would technically be scheduled as an extra, um, but you would be getting all the appropriate codes. So if you brought a mixed train, it would be classified as a manifest. Okay. Uh, if you brought a coal train, it would be coal train. Okay. All that sort of stuff. Uh, and if you're open to it, we can also give you some of them. Uh, we can't um, put the manifest trains into switching just because we can't include all of your cars into the program in a timely manner. But if you got a unit train and that could be switched, we can actually incorporate that. So if you've got, say, like an auto rack train, uh, we can set up a schedule so that your cars, some of your cars actually get dropped off at the auto yard and things like that. <laughs> so that you're not just running from back and forth, you're actually being included in the operations a little bit. So we, we can. Uh, adapt to whatever you bring. You just gotta let me know beforehand so I know to do it. Cool. We will have exactly this many people show up at every operating session. Yeah. <laughs> uh, arrive early if you can. Check the room. Uh, especially if you're bringing a train with you, make sure it's set up and ready to go. Uh, coordinate with me uh, to set up on what track you need to set up. But other otherwise, uh, just try to show up early. Yeah, it is. That's exactly what it is. Like I had to find an image of a lot of people in the club, and that's what we had. Um, must be skill trains. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, it is. Yeah, that's the skill train. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You got me. Uh, once, once the session starts, I'll outline all the basic rules uh, as well as any special rules. Sometimes we'll have um, like period uh, sessions for like steam, transition era, that sort of thing. And that, those will have special rules, like I was mentioning the VM. The caboose not being able to be shoved around, things like that. Uh, operators pick what trains they want to run. We're, I'm still trying to figure out how we want to do that. Um, when I put out the survey, the general consensus need, suggested that we need some sort of ranked choice system to be a little okay. bit more fair than just six sided dice. No. <laughs> oh, come <laughs> on! I don't want playing, to be completely random. Playing, uh, <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll figure out something that's more <laughs> fair than just a first come, first serve. Uh, but the goal is for that. Everyone who comes in gets to run at least one train. DA6. Uh, yeah, and usually, we're well, going to be having, even on a base schedule where no one brings extra trains, there's going to be like eight different trains, so there's going to be yeah. plenty of opportunities. DA6. Uh, and then before the session starts, we'll pick the dispatchers, the train masters, which will usually be the stage room, but we might have a different um, uh, person doing that. Stage hands and yard masters. As we all know, Kendall's not dispatched. 
<laughs> All right, then the session starts. Uh, the yard masters have to go out first. They get a little bit of a head start over everyone else so they can get started classifying. Um, and then each yard master uh, contacts the train master as each train's ready to go. Uh, the train master picks a crew. Uh, they'll come up to wherever the train master's sitting. They'll they'll get their um, switch list. They'll head to the yard, pick up their train, and start their job. Uh, once the yard job's done, they return to the yard. They give their switch, their manifest back to the yard master because the end of the uh, manifest actually tells the yard master which tracks the trains need to go into. Uh, and then the crew, the crew comes back to the lounge, and you repeat that until all jobs are complete. Uh, again, the goal is that everyone who comes gets to run at least one train, but if, if once everyone's run one train, you can go for a second. Uh, and then everything goes smoothly, and nothing goes wrong, ever. <laughs> oh no. Uh, ever. That must be Chris's locomotive. Yeah. No, that's probably Rhett. Oh, right there. <laughs> he doesn't run steam. No, but it's... I do smoke. Yeah. No, no, it can't be, it can't be Rhett. There's only one locomotive. <laughs> and that's the last one. <laughs> the last one. <laughs> that's the one that decoupled at the end, right? That was a helper. Yeah. What about helper servers? Okay, yeah, so obviously, That's advanced. We're doing that later. So, yeah. clearly something is going to go wrong, and it just needs to be handled in a, in a responsible way. So, for anything minor, um, that's going to be like a, a derail that you can reach and rerail within a few seconds, uh, a short, uh, an unplanned decoupling that you can fix in an easily reachable area. You don't need to tell dispatch, you just fix it and move on. Um, something that blocks the main for a lot, bit longer. Like if you derail somewhere in one of the hidden areas, if your decoder burns out, if you hit something, uh, or something falls off the layout, that's when you need to call the um, that insurance we were talking about. Yeah, call the dispatcher, <laughs> let them know that there's going to be a disruption to the main. Uh, don't get into any fights on the on the layout because that's not good. Uh, fix the problem, and, and then if it's someone else's fault, you can talk to them once you're both back in the, the lounge. And then if there's an actual emergency, uh, let dispatch know to stop all trains, call emergency services, clear the building, and except for anyone administering first aid or fire extinguisher. Once the session's over, everyone comes back to the lounge and gives feedback on what they liked about the session and what they want to change for the next session so we can keep these as fun as possible. Um, every, you're gonna be asked to, if you encounter any problems, just mark them on the back of your manifest. Uh, well, I'll collect them all at the end of the session. Uh, and then I can just submit a bulk report um, at the end to these guys. Uh, and then you can go home. Or you can keep running trains if you, if you like trains a lot. Oh, let's see. All right. Basic rules of all sessions. All of the rules and the bylaws apply. No harassment, what you can do, what you can and can't do with other people's trains, etc., etc., etc. If you haven't read the bylaws, you probably should. <laughs> with the exception for the hustling. Uh, hustling. 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 <laughs> if, uh, if you're given permission. Yes, so. if you give us permission, then they are allowed to handle Well, technically, you're allowed to handle anything on the land, but yeah. But yeah um, give us permission, and you can let other people drive your trains. Have fun. And I, I am serious about this. If, because the main goal of operating sessions, despite all of this really nitty gritty protocol stuff, is to have fun. So if you're not having fun for some reason, let me know. I want to make sure that there's, again, a nice balance between realism and entertainment. I don't want this to be a job. So I want to make sure that I get the right feedback to make this as fun for, as I'm not going to be able to please everyone. It's also the spirit of the hobby. I want to be able to, you know, make sure as many people as possible have a good Educate, don't be right. What does that mean? Don't be a. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm a nice I'm guy. Not, I don't know what so I'm not going to name any names, so I don't have any names. Okay, one of the main. One, <laughs> That's going on YouTube, right? Well, well, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to be marked for kids. <laughs> nice. That means it'll all be there. <laughs> I, can, I can bleep it out in the thing, it's fine. Oh, that just makes it even it's better. Because then all of a sudden the kids are going like, Ooh, what is he saying? Yeah, yeah, go to <laughs> Um, this is all getting edited out. Uh, <laughs> Why is this going to be a giant? There's no sound. Giant. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, basically, uh, one of the 
it didn't come up a lot, but we're, they come up a couple times in the survey I sent out that some people, if want session to be run a very particular way, and they will vocally let people know if it's not. Um, basically, um, if someone's doing something on the railroad that's not breaking any rules, and but it's not the way you would do it, just leave it alone. If you can talk to them afterwards, but if they're trying to run their trains like, hey, you really railroad went back up their trains like that, dude. It doesn't matter. Just let them run the train how they want to, and you can edit it afterwards. <coughs> because all that makes them feel is that they're being berated and harassed in the middle of a session, and no one likes that. So try to limit that, please. But do ask questions. This is the exact opposite of that. <laughs> if you are running and you have a question about how you're doing your job, how you might do it better, or how a real railroad might do it, yes, please ask, because I'd like for these to be an educational opportunity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, solicit advice with questions that spur further discussion. So you, that, cause you can ask a question and that spurs a whole uh, mutual discussion, which is a lot nicer. All right, run the rolling stock like your grandpa owned it. Uh, everyone knows that the club rolling stock that we have isn't in the best shape. Um, That's an understatement. But we wanna keep it from getting worse. And if possible, we wanna improve it as time goes on. So um, run, Treat everything gently, especially if you're running cars or an engine that's not yours uh, and is not the club's. Uh, if something does break, um, if it's a club, bring it back to the lounge, put it on the shelf, uh, and let the train master know so that he can take it off the list. Uh, and if you break something or something breaks on something that's not yours and not the club's, stop running it immediately so it doesn't break anymore and let the owner know ASAP. And, uh, and then that, help keep the layout running. Uh, if track breaks on the main line, notify the dispatcher so traffic can be rerouted. Luckily, we have lots of crossovers and turnarounds, so unless something breaks on one of the, the um, single line tracks, we can usually reroute around it. And that's actually an opportunity to do some like maintenance of way operations. So that can be fun. Um, if track breaks on a siding and spur while you're trying to work, uh, I've been trying to keep on top of keeping everything maintained. So <coughs> Most of the stuff that's going to be on your switch list should be working, but if something breaks that I haven't blocked off, uh, again, just put a note of it on your on the back of your switch list, uh, and just put your car that's supposed to go where the brick, broken um, switch is somewhere nearby. Not on the main line. Not on the main line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the, the goal is to have a rolling list of problems rather than a growing one, because we had these surveys where I had a list of about 50 different problems. We pared that down to about 10. I'd like to be able to have just one or two problems every session that get resolved as they go instead of having to keep having a big list of problems every time. And like anything, this layout requires maintenance, uh, a lot of cleaning. Uh, if you can, I would appreciate it if you could help clean uh, cars and track. Um, if you've got a bright boy or something like that, it might not be a bad idea to carry that with you as you're running. Uh, if you encounter some spotty track on the siding, usually just a little polish, get it right back in the, in the running shape. Uh, and that means I don't have to go around and clean the entire layout every time, so that does self sort of divvy the load out. Uh, if you've got the horsepower for it, it's not a bad idea to use a cleaning car as one of your handles that will leave your trains to keep those sidings nice and polished. Uh, and also, generally, just keep the club clean. Make sure all the trash goes in the garbage cans. Uh, recycle all your cans. Don't leave uh, dirt and stuff uh, on the ground. Just try to try to make it nice. Uh, be careful around scenery. So we've got all this plexiglass up right now, but that can make it a pain to switch. So during switching sessions, anywhere where there's places that you're going to switch, I'm taking the plexiglass down. So that the impetus is on you to try to be careful to not break any trees. Or buildings or anything like that. If you do, it's not that big of a deal. That's why I'm here. It's I'm a senior guy. Um, <laughs> just let me know. Uh, put it on the like the track plan. Put it on the back of your switch list, and so I know how to fix it. But just in general, try to be gentle um, around all the uh, scenery. Finally, if you can actually model the complete flying switch on layout, you have to show me. You. What? If you know, you know. <laughs> So do you want, which variant of the flying switch do you want? 
Whichever is most impressive. <laughs> well, you have the flying switch of where you have a guy at the switch. All right, let me actually explain. So I'll go back. Let me explain to everyone. That was a joke. But let me explain what that actually means to those who don't know. All right, so let's go back to our runaround move. Okay, so uh, let me go back. All right, so let's say you want to service this um, facing point, but you don't have to do a runaround. What you can do instead, a flying switch, you cut off all the cars that are not involved, you leave them off back here somewhere. Um, and this is what you do on the real river, where you have momentum and handbrakes. You speed your train up to, enough that the car will keep moving under its own momentum. You cut off your lo locomotive and speed past the switch. The brakeman is standing by the switch. As soon as he, as soon as he sees your locomotive pass, he throws the switch and jumps on the car. This car goes into the siding, and then he closes the handbrake. This is very, very illegal nowadays, but I can tell you for a fact from YouTube, it still happens. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's multiple different ways we do it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's super unsafe, but it happens. Oh, and then you have the fun of pulling a car. And we're going to simulate this in HO school. No, that's what I'm saying. Because <laughs> you need momentum to do it and a way to just pull the car. But if yeah. you can figure it out. Here's, here's momentum. <laughs> That's a little bit much. Yeah. Yeah. Car, well, gravity it was, switching. It was Rex's yeah. car. They are. <laughs> oh, they ain't gonna go nowhere. <laughs> too heavy and the first aren't that good. Yeah. All right. Well, so, well. if any of this sounds interesting to you, you want to start applying this stuff to your own layout or yeah. other layouts that you're involved in, you can see I have a whole span of books here. Uh, what I recommend to everyone is Track Plane for Realistic Operation by John Armstrong. Yeah. Uh, this is an old classic. It's from like the 70s, but it's the latest edition is from 98. But the, yeah, this is the Bible for not just track planning, but how real railroads set up their tracks. It actually explains the why. So this I recommend to everyone. Uh, also, Realistic Model for Railroad Operation by Tony Coaster. Uh, this Two is less book track planning, but more uh, how to incorporate uh, operational operation. schemes on your railroad. Uh, same for this. This is by the Operation Special Interest Group of the NMRA, OPSIG. They're uh, a, a, sort of a subgroup of the NMRA that focus on this sort of stuff. And you can see this is basically this, but bulked up. And they'll go into everything from manifest trains, passenger operations, uh, branch line operations. <laughs> this is a really good book if you can find it. And all these, um, you feel free to read them. Uh, if you want to borrow them, just let me know, and I'll take your name and your phone number so you don't run off with them. But and yeah, deposit, right? Your DNA firstborn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then any other special interest groups or special interests that have their own particular operations. So Model Railroad makes a, a book for basically every sort of subgroup of trains you could think of and how they operate. I have a lot of logging stuff because that's what I'm interested in. Uh, and then if you're interested in a particular route, a lot of times they will have a very, very particular and useful uh, operations notes. So this is for a book about the Greenbrier subdivision of the CNL. Uh, that's the branch line that ran, runs by CAS or RAN. It's closed now. No, it's back no. open. But it's not connected to the main line anymore. Well, it kind of is. It's, it's it is, but no, it it's not like it used to be. Semantics. <laughs> Semantics. <laughs> but for people that get really into the research on this, so you can see for this book, you can find whole timetables for specific years, mm -hmm. track layouts for various towns and yards, and you can get really into the weeds for whatever your prototype is, and or even if it's not your prototype, like this is really um, good resource if you're um, uh, trying to build a branch line of any type. And then also more specific stuff like history on like logging railroads or things like that. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Can I pull my choo choo's out yet? So to start with, uh, it's going to be normal time with a sequenced schedule. So basically, as we send out trains one at a time in a certain order. Um, once we're more, more in the flow of things, we're going to go about uh, four to one fast by. Take your slides back. Everyone runs in trains! Don't get up yet, because I have to explain what trains we're running. 